Coming up on Tech News Today, what Microsoft thought was so important they had to ruin everybody's Monday schedule for. Google wags a finger at governments and leaks on the Xbox 720. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, June 18th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToAssist by Citrix. Take control of your IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. Provide live or unattended support to all your users from anywhere. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToAssist.com and use promo code TNT. And by Ford, featuring the MyFord mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. The MyFord mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com com slash technology and by gazelle the easy way to sell your iphone ipad ipod or android smartphones from your home or office so you can get the latest versions get a risk-free quote that's good for 30 days at gazelle.com welcome to tech news today i'm tom merritt i'm Ayaz Akhtar. i Sarah, am omg chad <laughs> i'm sorry chad i forgot uh, uh jason howl out uh on vacation today sarah lane uh in london for the web had a hotel that was limiting her bandwidth uploads so we're dealing with that. Uh, she won't be with us today, but she will be back tomorrow. Thankfully, though, uh, we have Editor-in-Chief of Engadget, Tim Stevens, joining us. Welcome back to the show, Tim. Thanks very much for having me. Very excited about the Microsoft announcement today. Lots of stuff to talk about. Let's start with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Microsoft gathered the press together in Los Angeles this afternoon to announce they're making tablets. The Microsoft Surface RT will be a 9.3 millimeter tablet with USB 2 and we think 720p HD. The Microsoft Surface Pro will have Windows 8 Pro and an Intel Core Ivy Bridge, Core i5 Ivy Bridge processor inside and full HD. The Microsoft RT is one and a half pounds, 576 grams, uh, and the Windows 8 Pro Surface is a little bit heavier. They didn't announce any real availability or pricing. Uh, they did say that the Windows 8 launch would see the launch of the Surface RT and that the Surface Pro would launch three months after that. Uh, no price for the RT, although they did say it would be equivalent to what ARM tablets normally sell for, and the Pro would be priced on par with Ultrabook-class PCs. Uh, real quickly, before we continue the rest of the news fuse here, Iaz, what did you think of Microsoft getting into making tablets? I thought it was a wild move. I mean, I thought the Xbox was kind of a nutty idea, and I thought the Zoom was kind of a little bit out there. But this is competing with their hardware partners, and that seems a little bit strange for me because this is how Microsoft's worked for a long time. But if they think that a tablet is their future, they need to make sure they have one that works. And I, I'm actually surprised that it's actually as stylish as it is. I mean, it's actually a pretty product, and they're they're not just going. We're going to copy Apple with stuff. They have their uh, their their cover has a keyboard in it, and that's a really interesting. I think feature. that was the most impressive thing to me was that the cover. Because when they started talking about the cover, mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't care about covers. But one version has sort of a chiclety keyboard in it. The other has a full keyboard that they say you can type on just as good as any other keyboard. We don't know how much these covers are going to cost either, and we don't know if they're really going to work as promised. But if they do, that is exactly the kind of cover I want for a tablet. Something that is useful. Although it might run my battery life down. It's Bluetooth. And because it's so thin, it doesn't have a hinge built in. That's one of the reasons why the Surface had to have a kickstand. So it's these little small, like little design features that they've, that Microsoft thought about that makes, like, what's the actual perfect device that's a tablet and a PC and a laptop and this other thing? And they've, it seemed like they've crafted a somewhat of a usable solution with a kickstand and a cover that can be a keyboard. Of course, it's just announced uh, four colors, display port, HDMI built in, front and rear cameras, lots of specs to get into and look at and get some perspective on. We'll talk about it more on tomorrow's Tech News Today. It's official. Facebook just picked up facial recognition company Face.com. Now, Face.com produces mobile and desktop products, which makes tagging photos a lot easier. Facebook's mobile tagging isn't as great as its desktop version, so that's one potential use for the pickup. 
Every six months, the list of the fastest supercomputers gets updated, and that usually means a new champion. Today's list crowns IBM's Sequoia as the new top spot, putting a U.S. computer on top for the first time in two years. Sequoia is an IBM Blue Gene Q system using 1,572,864 processor cores. Take that. Ivy Bridge uh, scored 16.32 petaflops per second on the Linpack benchmark. Japan's K computer fell to second place. It was the previous champion with 10.51 petaflop per second. Google released another transparency report, this time spotlighting data about government requests to remove videos or blog posts or to hand over user information to those governments. Now, Google says it does not comply with every request it receives, but it has complied with 65% of court orders and 47% of more informal orders. Google described the trends as troubling because some of these requests come from democracies like the United States and Spain. Wagging the finger at you Western democracies. Samsung is cozy and up to big business. Starting in July, Samsung will offer a smartphone for business, including the Samsung Galaxy S3 with safe branding stands for samsung approved for enterprise with the catchy name you get aes 256 bit encryption better microsoft exchange active sync support and support for major vpn and mobile device management systems you can trade in your old phones too for up to 300 dollars per phone Microsoft security must just be some kind of unattended sign that says, don't steal our stuff, because a 56-page document leaked over the weekend, and it appears to detail Microsoft's plans for its next Xbox, a possible Google, Google Glass competitor, and the Connect 2. Now, the document is from August 2010, and says the Xbox 720, and that's the name of the, of the console in the document, will support 3D, Blu-ray, and have DVR functionality at a price under $300. The leaked document was posted on Scribd and has since been taken down with a note saying it was, it was removed at the request of Covington and Burling LLP. Oh, by the way, that's one of Microsoft's attorneys. They should draw eyes on all of their secret documents. Apparently that makes people be more honest that could work. when they see drawings of eyes. Uh, winning awards hasn't changed Linus Torvald's candor. The Linux kernel inventor gave a talk at the Alto University in Finland and during a Q&A session was asked about NVIDIA's lack of support for Linux with its Optimus technology. Uh, let's play it. The exception rather than the rule. And I'm also happy to very publicly point out that NVIDIA has been one of the worst trouble spots we've had with hardware manufacturers. And that is really sad because NVIDIA tries to sell chips, a lot of chips, into the Android market. And NVIDIA has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with. So NVIDIA. <laughs> and then he said the F word and flipped off the camera. <laughs> uh, the outburst may not be representative of his entire talk on hardware support, which was generally positive, but it certainly grabbed all the attention. Mozilla demoed its iPad browser, and there's no flipping off here. In a video presentation last week, dubbed Junior, Mozilla wanted to build a browser for the tablet form factor and threw away all kinds of Chrome. No more address bar, no tabs on the top of the screen. Junior would bring full screen browsing to, with two overlaid buttons, the back button and the plus button. So when is this rethought browser coming to you? Well, no idea, because Mozilla didn't mention any dates. Soon. It's coming soon. Uh, Reuters reports Facebook has agreed to pay $10 million to settle a lawsuit concerning its sponsored stories advertisements. Five Facebook users alleged Facebook's sponsored stories used their likes without paying them or giving them a chance to opt out. The United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team, otherwise known as CERT, found a vulnerability that affects every Intel 64-bit processor. Now, the vulnerability actually takes advantage of AMD's x86-64 instruction set on Intel processors, which would allow a local hacker to run a malicious code at the highest security levels. Now, Microsoft has already issued a patch, but the exploit could affect BSD and potentially OS X as well. All right, we're going to talk about that uh, Google transparency report and the Xbox leak. But first, let's thank our sponsor for today's show, GoToAssist. If you work in IT, you know how complicated it can be to keep all your systems up and running. Uh, you're trying to keep all your users supported. They're in there doing all kinds of crazy. You don't know what they're going to do. Go to Assist lets you keep an eye on it. Uh, the tools here are not making your job more difficult. If you use Go to Assist like we recommend, you can take control of your IT world from one simple cloud-based cl platform. Go to Assist World Class Remote Support Module lets you provide live or unattended support to all your users. Unattended support. You can actually prevent things from happening. Do preventative maintenance, and you don't have to be wandering around from station to station. You can remotely get in there, fix what's wrong, 
customizable dashboards displaying performance of all your network servers and desktops, plus proactive alerting. Uh, let you fix those small issues before they become big issues. Go to Assist is easy to use. You set it up in just minutes. And it's from Citrix, a trusted leader in IT. Why he's made Leo's job a whole lot better. He doesn't have to get up out of bed. You got a server reboot, John. You don't have to call John. He doesn't have to do anything but click a couple buttons. Everything's back and ready to go right here at Twitch. So sign up for your special 30-day free trial today. Visit gotoassist.com. Click on the Try It Free button and use this promo code TNT. That's gotoassist.com. Promo code TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Let's start with this Google transparency report. Uh, this is the same report that we talked about a couple weeks ago where they showed what copyright takedown notices had been coming and where they had been coming from. They've now updated this, as they do every six months, with new information about what governments are doing. So this is for uh, the period of July to December 2011. During that period, U.S. court and government requests doubled from 92 to 187. Uh, it was 54 year over year, but it, so it just keeps going up and up and up. Google does not comply with every one of these, but that's the number of requests they got. Uh, they also highlighted a bunch of hilarious ones. There was one from Passport Canada uh, objecting to a YouTube video of a Canadian urinating on a passport and then flushing it down the toilet. Uh, Google did not remove that one. So what's going on here is Google's trying to say, look, these are the countries that are making requests. These are the kinds of requests they're making. And this is how we respond. For instance, the United States made 6,321 requests. Google complied with 93% of them, but not all of them. Tim, how does this make you feel about Google? Do you feel like they're fighting for your side by, by giving you this information and, and not always giving in to governments? Or does it just sound creepy? Uh, well, it's it's always a little bit creepy, but I definitely tend to feel a little bit better about Google after reading this. A, it's almost like they're picking on these governments. You know, they're singling out some of the crazier requests that these governments have made, which almost sends a message to these governments. You better be careful what you ask for, because we might just make fun of you for it, as indeed they have uh, like the, the, the Canada uh, passport issue, like you mentioned. Uh, but overall, I think they're at, at about a 50 percent compliance for, for these requests, which is, um, you know, uh, lower than I might have guessed it, it would be. And, and like you mentioned, these requests are growing, and I think they'll continue to grow, probably doubling every six months or so as we go forward, as companies now know that they have, at least have a venue to do this kind of thing. But I, I think it's good on Google that they're you know, exposing these requests and giving a little bit more transparency into what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I was taking a look at the list from the, uh, Google's post, and they talk about the United States and what exactly the U.S. wanted taken down. And they were talking about the U.S. wanted certain things that were defaming law enforcement. I mean, defamation is a crime. So if it doesn't scream like, it doesn't scream as if the United States is abusing its power right away saying, you need to take down something that seems to be just mildly offensive. If it's a crime, the Google, Google will, they want to comply with the law. That's what they keep saying. That's what they have to do. It's, it's, it's good business. But they always make a good point because people seem to be afraid that the U.S. government is going to push around YouTube or Google and make sure the content that, that should be there is taken down illegally. And Google puts it up in everyone's face saying, we did not comply with a lot of these requests. And they want to make sure that people get that message across, that they're not just some whipping boy. I, I do think that it's good that they uh, to make this transparent because when they comply with local laws, you see what those local laws are. For instance, criticism of the monarch in Thailand, for instance, something we wouldn't expect to happen in in most democracies does happen there and things get taken down google complies with that because that's the local law but should google be in that judgmental position i mean it, 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 google is sort of weighing these things and saying well you know we're, we're going to decide when it's in our best interest to resist and when it's not uh whereas other companies that may run into this same sort of growing trend for takedowns might not be so civic minded and Google might not stay so civic minded uh, forever. Tim, does this does this worry you that the trend is an ever increasing number of takedowns and that maybe Google and, and others might not be so resistant in the future? Yeah, it's definitely a, a slippery slope that, that they're, uh, you know, uh, increasingly sliding down, I guess is the best way to put it. And the more requests that they get, the harder it is for them to be consistent in handling these requests. We've seen issues in the past with Apple kind of being selective about what they allow into the App Store and what they don't. 
And uh, ultimately, this is kind of the same sort of thing where Google is going to be selective about what they take down and what, what they don't. Uh, there's a request here from Pakistan, for example. Um, they were satirizing the Pakistani army and senior politicians, and they decided not to take that down. Uh, but ultimately, it seems like a small step from that to satirizing, you know, the the king, like you mentioned before. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, uh, an area that's going to be very difficult for Google to, to be consistent on going forward. And especially as these requests continue to increase, they're going to have to have more and more staff looking at these things every day. And to keep everybody on the same page is going to be difficult. Uh, I'm guessing we're going to see a lot of controversy coming out of these in the future. But for now, it seems like Google's got a pretty level-headed approach to all these things. And I hope that they're able to, to maintain that going forward. I wonder if, if Google, like, they bother to check which country is pinging them and they don't put that country that they're making fun of, particularly difficult ones. Maybe they don't bother to put up, oh, by the way, we're going to skewer this one country. But when you show up from that country, we're not going to show you that little bit of, of information because this, is, this transparency report, sure, it's going to be up there, but how many, how many countries can actually access this? Because, I mean, China— I like, think all the countries except maybe China. Yeah, China does— you know, that, Although China's not in this one. There is a mention of, I think it was like a previous, session, a previous yeah. period where— uh, China sent three total requests. Or, Iran probably can't, right. may so or may not be able to access it. And they thing. add this little note, YouTube was inaccessible in China during this Yeah, which is period. great. So it's a little, you know, a little skewering. Yeah. All right, let's uh, move on to the massive Xbox leak that happened on Scribd over the weekend. It's gone now. Yes. But lots down. of interesting information in there. So let, let's just run down the feature list that's in this 56-page document, and let's see if you guys think it's true or not. Connect version 2 would have better voice recognition, use stereo imaging for better accuracy, track up to four players and have better cameras, and the device might actually be two separate units for better tracking. You guys think that Connect 2 would be this two-part thing? That seems reasonable. It's not what I would have predicted, but, it's, but it, seems, it doesn't seem outlandish that, that Connect might moderately upgrade in that way. What do you think, Tim? Uh I think there would definitely be a Connect 2. I think that makes a lot of sense. But but having it be a two-piece thing that you then need to rely on the consumer to place two things in the right place rather than just putting one thing in the right place, um, you know, that's that's definitely asking for a lot of more opportunities for somebody to put it in the wrong place, I guess. Uh, so I would really think that it would be, you know, one thing that's out there, not two things. but uh, One thing with two cameras, maybe? Right. I mean, I can yeah. see them maybe extending the width of the Connect by a bit to get a bit more perspective than it has right now. I mean, that's what they're looking to fix here is having more perspective so that you can get instead of just a 180 degree field of view on whatever you're scanning, have more of a 360 degree field of view. If that makes sense. Um, but having two people or having two things that have to be stuck on top of your TV instead of one um, might be one too many things on top of your TV. I don't know, maybe they're training us. If they give us one device one time, they're like, well, next iteration, we'll give you two. <laughs> and the next iteration, three, I don't, I don't know. I, I can see it being broken up. Maybe one piece that breaks apart if you have the, the room to do it. Uh, the uh, next rumor, or the next thing from this leak, connect glass, glasses, codenamed Forta, Fortaleza, aimed for 2014. Fortaleza. Fortaleza, Fortaleza yes. Aimed for 2014. The console will be out in 2013, according to this, this leak. It would connect it to a smartphone synced with the 720 over Wi-Fi, and would offer ambient experiences and provide, quote, seamless integration of the digital world with the physical world. What it actually does is uses Xbox Live, and it runs real-time information on people, places, and things. Do you guys think the Xbox 720 would have, well, augmented reality glasses? I'm already and having a hard time cowboys. keeping smart glass and project glass straight in my head. This is going to make it all, a whole lot worse. But, yeah, sure, I, I absolutely could see this as sort of the way the Kinect was, much later in its life period, but sort of a way to revive the Xbox, them saying, hey, and now, you know, the Xbox has been out for a year. We're going to add these glasses in for those of you to, to add more functionality. What do you think, Tim? Uh, I think anything that makes a ghost cowboy come out of my screen is a very good thing. <laughs> uh, ultimately, these glasses have to be fairly expensive, and we've never, ever seen a case where an expensive peripheral for a console has been successful. And this would be, you know, perhaps the most awesome expensive peripheral of all time. It certainly beats the, uh, the light gun on the Super Nintendo or sure. any of those other things we've seen <laughs> in the past. But ultimately, you know, for these things to be successful, not only do they have to be cool, but people have to buy them. And then once people buy them, developers have to see that and make games for them. Uh, and there's a lot of ifs there. So if we're talking a set of two or $300 glasses that people need to buy to have this amazing gameplay experience, is it going to be successful? I don't know. Uh, we haven't seen companies be successful there before. So Microsoft really wanted to dive in head first and have something outrageous like this. Um, it'd be great. But uh, again, I'm skeptical. Maybe that's why Microsoft called the whole project. They call it Smart Glass. So it can go to your glasses, it can go to your mm -hmm. tablet, mm -hmm. whatever. Maybe it's be 
brand the new smart tablet that will, yeah. uh, spec wise the 720 would have 6 to 8 2 gigahertz ARM or x86 cores they're not sure yet two additional ARM or x86 cores for the operating system three power PC cores for backwards compatibility <laughs> and the document suggests base hardware with multiple configurations so you get different versions of the 720 based on specs do you think Microsoft would introduce different 720s yeah, the, I, I mean, they already have introduced different hardware for the Xbox 360 when you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so so why not come out of the gate that way? And I think that, you know, some of these specs sound a little crazy, but if this is an actual leak of a planning document from a couple of years ago, from 2010, mm -hmm. then all of this might have been on the table. It doesn't mean they're going to do it, but it means that this is sort of what they were testing out and playing with and seeing if it would work. And why not shoot for the sky? Tim, what do you think? You think it's going to be like Windows where there's like... Xbox Ultimate 720, there's Windows Consumer Preview 720, or whatever they'd call it. Uh, that's that's a really scary proposition. Uh, really, really scary. Uh, uh, if, if you look at developer feedback with the current generation of next generation consoles, the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, the devs of the PS3 complain that having all these cores is confusing and hard to write for. Uh, the devs of the Xbox 360 complain that they can't expect there'll be a hard drive because there were multiple configurations. And, and this slide effectively takes those two worst things about these current consoles and mixes them together. So you have multiple configurations with, uh, you know, how many cores are we talking here? Um, 13 cores. That's That, again, makes me very skeptical. But again, like you mentioned, th this document, if indeed it is legitimate, it seems to be dated to around September of, of, of 2010. So it's... It's out of date, so maybe they were throwing a bunch of things at the wall to see what would stick. But again, this yeah. makes me skeptical. They, pre they presented it. The developers all said what you just said, <laughs> and they've changed it since then. And the last yes. big thing, target Quite date possible. Target date is 2013 holiday season with a target price of 299 That bundle would include this new Kinect. Is that a, I think 2013 sounds like a reasonable time because the Xbox 360 is long in the tooth. But $300, do you think that's a price point they could hit, Tim? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the price point that they have to hit. Uh, we're all expecting that we'll see new consoles at E3 next year, and we're all expecting that they will be launching at the end of next year. And two ninety nine is it seems like a good price point. I mean, that's that's been the case for the past couple of years now. I think that would be a good price point for them to launch with, especially if they can bundle in Connect. But for that price, I don't think we would expect to see the Fortaleza uh, super fancy augmented reality glasses. I think that's a bit too optimistic. All right, before we take another break, uh, let's talk quickly about that Mozilla mobile browser for the ipad yeah. now, firefox is not ha, has a thing it has mm -hmm. an app on phone, ios but something. it's not a browser right uh, so right now the, the uh, last week mozilla showed off and we talked about this in news views they showed off a prototype browser called junior total re, total redesign the concept is the browser needed to be re reinvented for the tablet form factor so there's no chrome on the top there's no address bar there's this left and right navigation left for back and there's a plus button on the right do, does anyone think the browser really needs to be reinvented for the tablet form factor? I mean, it's just another screen. Do we need this re, like this radical redesign? Yeah, they were kind of harsh in that video saying that, you know, Safari is a miserable experience. Mm -hmm. It's still the best. Uh, and they apologize. They're like, sorry, Android users. Safari is still the best on mobile, but it's miserable because they just took the browser off the desktop and slapped it into mobile. I don't think that's quite fair i mean i i have used android browsers and i have used ios safari and i find them quite usable and things like atomic and opera on ios work great but because they're not default i end up going back and using safari all the time and i think that's that's the big hang up here is firefox can do whatever they want and make a browser that's reinvented but they're gonna have to go a long way to convince me to continue to use it when i can't make it the default browser that launches when I click a link in email or in some other app. Yeah, as long as Apple owns that that gateway into the default browser status uh, on iOS, ultimately nobody can really compete, and I don't think anybody will. Uh, whether Apple will ever hand over the keys to that to somebody else, uh, that might even be something that the government's going to have to step in and make that happen at some point down the road. Uh, Android, of course, is a different case, and there's a, a zillion different browsers there. I, I do think there's room to, to get more creative and to rethink what a browser can and should be. Uh, on a tablet, but ultimately, I, I wouldn't say so far as that bad. It's fine. It's functional. It's not uh, not an awful experience. But there is room for improvement. And I think this is an interesting uh, experiment there. But yeah, for, for the reasons we already mentioned, it's probably not going to be a big success. Bear, our sysadmin in the uh, chat room says that was an internal dev conversation. Trust me, marketing folks did not approve it being shown publicly. So some of the harsher things they said probably Gosh. wouldn't have been said officially. But you think the government's going to step in and? and break up the uh, safari default tim well 
maybe a couple of years down the road, but I mean, the government did step in and make Microsoft split IE out of the OS. So it, it's not completely unreasonable to think that maybe at some point all these developers of browsers will complain enough that that Apple is monopolizing the iOS market and forcing them out. And so therefore they should have access. Uh, you know, I hope we don't get to that point. I hope that Apple maybe opens things up a little bit. But, uh, you know, you could you could definitely make a case there if you wanted to. There's definitely the precedent that has been set. Well, uh, we've got some numbers on Apple's dominance to get to in a second. But first, I want to thank our other sponsor, uh, My Ford mobile app this episode of tnt is brought to you by ford featuring that app the my ford mobile smartphone app is for electric vehicles and it is useful it's not like they just made some crappy app to throw up there this is a real solid useful and quality application it takes advantage of the value charging feature powered by microsoft based on your local utilities participation it allows ford customers to take advantage of off-peak or reduced rates from their utility without a complicated setup process this app saves you money you can use go times to precondition your vehicle's temperature before your departure. That saves your battery energy because you're not spending too long heating it up or cooling it down, saving you more money, optimizing your electricity. You can monitor your charging. You can get alerts. You can find charging stations, plan out your drive, saves you time. Share and learn smart driving tips in your forums on the MyFord mobile website with other people using their electric cars to the best advantage. And there's even gaming features. If you're kind of competitive, you can get on that leaderboard. Uh, unique achievements and social networking available to drivers of Ford Electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles. And monitor how far you drive. I'm a stats nerd. I love this kind of stuff. How much CO2 you save by not using gas. The MyFord mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. And the 2012 Ford Focus Electric is available right now for purchase. Go check it out. Go stop by your Ford dealer or, or just go to the web. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And we thank Ford for their support of Tech News Today. A couple more things to discuss here. That online publishers association study I just referred to has been released and says that 52% of the U.S. citizens surveyed own an iPad, uh, at least of tablet owners, while 51% own android now you're like that's 103 percent, tom well some of them own both so there's a little overlap there most of the android owners own kindle fires kindle fire accounted for 28 percent of all tablets close to the ipad 2 ipad 2 led the way with 31 percent, but ahead of ipad 3 the new ipad only had eight percent now this survey was taken march 19th through 26th so a little earlier in the ipad 3's life time or the the new ipad the third ipad whatever you want to call it uh, the other statistics are pretty normal. Tablet owners use their devices for 13.9 hours per week on average. 74% use it daily. I figured it'd be more than that. Uh, by 2013, OPA predicts that 47% of consumers will own a tablet, up from a mere 11% in 2011. And Ingrid London at TechCrunch pointed out it took five years from the first iPhone to the point when the majority of U.S. Smart or phone owners owned a smartphone. Uh, and and iPads will will make that in three years. Uh, so, what, however you look at these numbers, tablet usage is skyrocketing. Tim, how is that changing things? I mean, you're you're a publisher. You're you're in charge of Engadget, and you guys are are doing great stuff with the uh, the magazine that you put out uh, as an app. How is this changing the thinking of of how people are approaching the world of the internet when there's so much tablet use happening and getting more all the time? Yeah, mobile consumption is, uh, you know, it was kind of a footnote to our, our uh, benchmarks and statistics up to even a year ago. But now it, it is uh, something that we focus on and something that we really make sure that we are uh, captivating that uh, that group of users more so than anybody else. Uh, it's already to the point now where mobile consumption of our site has surpassed that of desktop consumption. So tablet users are a big part of, uh, of you know, what makes us great because they're a lot of the eyeballs on the site. So as we go through and, and rethink what we want the site to look like and how we want the site to operate, uh, making it look great on tablets is, is at the top of our list for sure. So it's, it's definitely adding new challenges, though, especially the, the new iPad with the high resolution screen. Now we need to talk about having high resolution assets and then we need to worry about, you know, 3G connections. And is it OK to have a high res 620 width picture uh, picture on there that's going to look good on a retina display? Uh, it's, you know, opening the doors to a lot more discussions, but ultimately it's making us rethink how we do things. And that's always a good thing. And one of the things about the study that other studies didn't do that they, they included 
the Barnes & Noble Nook as an Android tablet. And sometimes, for some reason, that's left off because it is such a, a different variant of Android. And you hardly ever notice that Android's under there, similar to the Kindle Fire. But the Kindle Fire has been talked about enough as a forked Android tablet. Uh, but strangely, in the study, the HP Touchpad is counted as an Android device at 8%. So whether they looked at <laughs> touchpads running Android or not, I don't know. So that might skew the numbers. It's, just, it's only 8%. It's not that big a deal. But I, it's, it's interesting to see what the definitions of PCs are, where, where they're going, where the definition of tablets are. Because is a reader a tablet? Is an iPad a tablet? Is a Fire a tablet? Because this becomes the question. Because then we see the other studies that say, no, that tablet's a PC, but that Fire's not a PC. Right. So it's, it's, it's just a different form factor. They're getting more and more interesting. And the fact that the iPad's able to reach the levels of, of smartphones is because the smartphones basically trained everybody how to use one of these things. Because when the first iPad came out, everyone was like, oh, big iPhone? Who wants a big iPhone? That's just silly. No one's ever going to buy these things, and then they sold. All right, let's finish up with the uh, the funny junk oatmeal battle royale. Uh, those of you who don't know what's going on with Matthew Inman's fight against funny junk, uh, here's the the quick recap. Uh, Matthew Inman uh, was mad about how funny junk had handled the posting of oatmeal comics at its site. Uh, wrote a blog post criticizing that, saying they're they're kind of taking his stuff without use, and he likes to share and everything, but he didn't like the way they were doing it. Uh, Oatmeal Comics, uh, Funny Junk, then sent a threatening letter to Oatmeal Comics claiming defamation and asking for $20,000 in damages. Inman responded by creating Operation Bear Love Good Cancer Bad, saying he was going to raise $20,000, take a picture of it, send it to Funny Junk, and then give the money to charity uh, to fight cancer as well as giving some to the uh the, the world wildlife foundation lawyer charles carrion was a little confused by all this for funny junk and on friday he filed a lawsuit with himself as plaintiff it's not on behalf of funny junk with himself as plaintiff saying in san francisco federal court that inman aka the oatmeal uh the indiegogo website Inman used to raise his money and inman's two charities of choice the national wildlife foundation and the American Cancer Society. So I, 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 mis- I mistakenly said the wrong foundation earlier, National Wildlife Federation. Uh, all are named in the lawsuit. And he named 100 anonymous does who he complains have been emailing him, uh, threatening and malicious emails, signing him up for email lists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he also revealed that he had contributed to the fund, which then gave him standing as a contributor to name the charities Here's what he's doing. He's demanding that Indigo Pop, which provided the fundraising platform, not get any of the money and that further none be paid out to Inman. Claims the charities have failed to perform their statutory duty to exercise authority over the Bear Love campaign because they haven't said anything. He says that's tacit support. And he claims Inman's fundraiser was conducted in violation of the California law pertaining to commercial fundraisers, that someone incited by Inman created a fake Twitter account posing as Cameron, and that Inman incited cyber vandalism against Carrion with the Bear Love campaign. He had said last week that he was going to comb through California code and find something that Inman had violated, and it seems like this is his best guess. Yeah, I mean, Carrion looks like he, he, was, he, was, he took a personal offense to this. And knowing that he can't start saying intentional, uh, intentional, what's the thing? IED, IED, intentional infliction of emotional distress. I always mess that up. Okay. Infliction of, of, of not improvised explosive device. No, not that at all. But <laughs> emotional distress, not causing emotional distress. He can't use that as a cause of action. He can't use uh, defamation. He can't use other things. So this lawyer goes out and tries to find what could possibly get uh, the oatmeal creator in trouble, and whether or not. He has a good faith standing in doing this. I'm not really sure. But to say previously, I take offense to this and I'm going to get you publicly, that's a, just a stupid move. Okay, because if, if, if anyone attacks this lawsuit, they're going to say this is not in good faith. It might technically still be in good faith because he has legal standing to do this. But it's just it just shows poor character that you just went out and sought some ridiculous cl- uh, cause of action to stop the oatmeal creator. This reminds me of Jack Thompson. Do you remember him, the, yes. the anti-video game lawyer who wound up being disbarred after a ridiculous number of lawsuits? Um, it's definitely smacks of the same sort of a- attitude and angst against uh, you know the online community as a whole. And that didn't work out very well for Jack, so I have to imagine it's not going to work out very well here either. Yeah, I think Carrion is not steeped at all in Internet culture, uh, but he is very aware of how the Internet works. 
In other words, he's 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 not. It's not like he doesn't get it. It's not like he's technically an idiot or anything. He actually knows tech, but he has he doesn't participate in this internet culture. So when Inman came at him, he reacted the way a lawyer would react and said, "Well, you're coming at me. I'm going to come at you with my own tools." And uh, he is definitely losing the war for popular opinion, but I don't think he cares. Just to quibble with that. I don't know if he would react the way a lawyer would react. He's reacting the way somebody who was really annoyed Says a lawyer. would be, and he would have hired an attorney. <laughs> he just happens to be an attorney who was annoyed. No, you're, it's a good it's correction. A, I don't want to tar difference. all lawyers with Carrion's reaction. But usually they're not self-firing guns, okay? They don't usually go off yeah, yeah. and sue people. But this guy has an issue. But when I say that, I'm saying he took a legal response. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, give me a chance I, to rephrase, because that's that, what I mean is he didn't react as an internet citizen. No. He reacted... From a legal perspective, mm-hmm. if, if that goes down a little bit. I got, got to defense, defend, uh, defend the defenseless sometimes here. Uh, we, we'll, we'll see what the poor judge <laughs> makes of this trial and keep you updated on Tech News today. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Uh, we have a couple of ways for you to relive the black and white days of OS 8, OS Nine, all, all depends. Uh, there's two old school uh, postings up here today. One is taking the Apple 1984 original OS and uh, bringing back those white icons for your current Mac. It's a skin, essentially, uh, that was created. Designer Ben Vesey said he was fed up with the current trend of making icons shiny and the overuse of shadows and gradients. Uh, so he made a minimalist flat color icon skin that eventually turned into being an homage to the original Mac. What a great way to use that new Retina display, right? Just a go- great <laughs> way. Never mind. <laughs> okay, that was pretty awful, but yeah, funny. Sorry about that. But yeah, so if, I, I mean, people love this kind of thing. What's the other one? It's an emulator. Nook Simple Touch homebrew hack uh, that it, it, it also emulates the, uh, the original Mac OS. On the Nook Simple Touch. Well, yeah. that definitely is not sanctioned at all because Microsoft and Barnes & Noble are all buddy-buddy. You dare not have Macintosh OS. This is actually an Nook. emulator. So this is running. This isn't a design thing. This is uh, this is running Mac OS on a Simple Touch. I wonder how it actually runs speed-wise. Because, I mean, th- these tablets these days, they have p- pretty powerful processors. Uh, it says the hack wasn't exactly flawless, but, you know, nothing. Does it still make the frowny face Mac when it crashes? That's what I want to know. I hope so. Yeah. I think that would be fantastic. All right, uh, one more quick break, and uh, then we'll get to the calendar and your feedback. Uh, thanks to Gazelle for sponsoring Tech News today. Uh, if you want these new gadgets that you're hearing about, there's all they're raining down from heaven these days. You might want to get rid of some of your old gadgets. Uh, you want that new iPad, that latest iPhone, or Android smartphone, that new Microsoft tablet? Sell your used iPhone, iPad, iPad, Mac, or smartphone to Gazelle and get some cash to trade up. Go to gazelle.com. Get a risk-free quote that's good for 30 days. This is this is what hooked me into starting to use Gazelle. As I go in, I get the quote, it's good for 30 days. Uh, and so gadgets don't usually get more valuable over time. The faster you do it, the more money you're going to come home with, and you'll get paid fast. Once you send them the device, as soon as they get it and check it out, make sure it's in good condition or at least the condition you described it was in, uh, they'll send you a check. They'll send you the money by PayPal. That's how what I do. It's the fastest. Or you can actually get an Amazon gift card and get 5% more. Quotes vary by models. Be sure to enter that correct model. They will check it for you. They'll even upgrade it if it's in better condition than you said. Try to be as accurate as possible. Uh, And when you get your quote, you print out the label, send it to them, and Gazelle will send you your money. It helps you feel better about your gadget habits. You're not throwing things away. They're not ended up in a dump. Gazelle does proper recycling of gadgets if they can't sell them. Uh, remember, just like when you drive a car off the lot, your gadgets lose their value over time. So go to Gazelle.com now. Get the best offer. Find out what your gadget is worth. Visit Gazelle.com for your risk-free quote today. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Well, Sarah's not here. I think I'll take care of this for her. Unless, I just thought, you're, I thought you were going to pretend to be Sarah. I can't pretend to be Sarah. That's no. impossible. She's right. fantastic. The AT&T Samsung Galaxy S3 is due to ship starting today. Due to ship. That's what it says. The European Union's International Trade Committee is now set to meet this Thursday, uh, June 21st, in Brussels to give its recommendation to the European Parliament regarding... ACTA. This vote is the most significant in the run-up to what will eventually be the full vote before the European Parliament, which has slated a vote in July. The Canadian Galaxy S3, that launch has been pushed back to June 27th due to unprecedented demand. 
So, you know, those Canadians, they're, they're really demanding. They are. Those demanding Canadians. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Chris writes in and says, what's up, TNT crew? I was listening to your report a few days ago in which you mentioned Yelp's problems with Google scraping their results as well as their partnership with Apple and Bing. I couldn't help but notice that Yelp relies on Google Maps for their mapping feature on the web as well as mobile. With their newly minted partnership, I wouldn't be surprised if Yelp started using Bing Maps or Apple Maps in their mapping feature. What are your thoughts? I doubt they're going to use Apple Maps. I don't think Apple's going to let anybody else but Apple use those maps, but... I don't know, Tim. Do you think uh, Yelp would switch to Bing? Uh, I think Microsoft would love for them to switch to Bing. I'm sure <laughs> yeah. they'd write them a very large check if they chose to do so. So I, I think that it's something that we could see. But, uh, you know, all these uh, transitions take time and money to make happen. So uh, I, I wouldn't see Yelp really running to do this, but it could it could happen. I believe it. Next email from Robin says, Hi, I have something to add to the discussion on TNT on the June 15th about people being annoyed with Dropbox removing the public folder. I make websites, and the public folder has proven invaluable for super simple web hosting. I use it to test designs on different computers and iPad, iPhone, and this, this is not going to work as far as I can tell with the new custom public folders. I won't have to worry about this, but for new users, it's definitely one less awesome feature. P.S. An alternative solution has been luckily provided by uh, Drapachi. Get .com slash ds, or you could do I think uh, was it? I used to use these all the time. Map, amp, and lamp. There's a whole bunch of these. Oh yeah, okay. I think we mentioned this on on Friday, but uh, to Robin's point. We got an email from Simon in Liverpool who said to explain the difference between the old Dropbox public folder and the new model, because I was wondering why that would change. The old model acted like web space. Files loaded directly into a browser and any dependencies are fetched too. So you could actually use that to serve a, a mock-up of a website. Simon says the new model acts like a file repository. Files are not served as is, but wrapped in a preview page with a link to download the original and dependencies must be downloaded separately. He says, although I'm not a heavy user of the public folder, I'll admit it can be handy sometimes. For example, the other day I needed to assess the performance of some WebGL code, copying the HTML and JavaScript to my public folder. I emailed the link to friends and asked them to report back on the frame rates they got. So it sounds like if you've got the current public folder, it'll continue to work that way. But sadly, these new public folders don't allow you to do that and maybe there's not that many people who are going to run into this issue but it is an issue for some and and we were wondering like why would you get so upset about this mm -hmm. here's here's the reason here's the answer thanks everybody for uh watching or listening you can submit stories for us to cover in our subreddit technewstoday.reddit.com we thank everybody who goes in there and either submit stories or just votes if you just vote you're helping out quite a bit because we look at those number of votes when we decide what stories to cover on tech news today every day tim stevens thank you so much uh for joining us uh lots of good stuff going on over in gadget what's uh what's what's cooking over there yeah, well, the Microsoft event is cooking as we speak. And then we've got Google I.O. coming up next week, which will be big. And the Microsoft Windows Phone Summit is happening this week as well. So a lot of big events going on right now. It's been a busy June. It's part of the trifecta of developer summits, WWDC, Windows Phone, and then Google I.O. at the end of the year. Very exciting. And a lot of frequent flyer miles for me. Nice. <laughs> a holy trinity. Uh, thank you all for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Or give us a call and leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Brian Brushwood. See you then.